Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, depending on when you're watching this. If you have any questions and you're joining us live, I will be available to take the questions and hopefully give you answers. Okay, next slide. Okay, my name is Chuck Nitch. I'm a physical therapist, and I believe most of you or all of you have had contact with a physical therapist in the past. I'm also a certified exercise expert for the aging adult, which means I completed a extended course offered by the American Physical Therapy Association, which involved education and training in exercises, plus a written examination and a practical examination after that. I've had over 40 years of clinical practice, mostly in a general hospital, outpatient orthopedics and sports medicine, and I did some home care where I rendered the treatments inside the client's home. I also served as an adjunct faculty in a doctor physical therapy program, primarily as a lab assistant for exercises and soft tissue treatments. Next slide. Okay, my have, I have a history of cardiquina. I am a cardiquina person. It started in June of 2018, as you see centralized back low back pain and you see the progression i got the symptoms of ces a spinal abscess was discovered and it wasn't until july 10th that i had a laminectomy and due to the abscess was on six weeks of antibiotics and currently the ces symptoms continue next slide so my talk and presentation is a little bit about balance today well, as you can see this is a medical definition of balance which is the even distribution of weight in other, enabling someone or something to remain upright and steady. In other words, without balance, we would fall over. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's an incidence of falls according to the World Health Organization. As you can see, 684,000 people die every year from falls. That's incredible. 37.3 million are severe enough to require medical attention which makes falls the second leading cause of unintentional injury death, which is after traffic accidents. Next slide. Okay, so with falls, we're gonna start talking about a base of support. So a base of support is if you're sitting in a chair, it's the four legs of the chair and your feet. The area beneath you, every point of contact with the supporting surface, which is the floor. If you're in a rocking chair, that only becomes four pieces, the, the rockers and your, and your feet. When you're standing, there's two bases of support, your two feet. Next slide. And then within that, within that base of support is the center of gravity, which the medical definition, as you see, is the point at which the entire weight of the body is concentrated and the amount of mass or weight is equal in any direction horizontally. So you're balanced. In the human body, the center of gravity is usually just in front of or anterior to the second sacral vertebrae, which is the base of the spine. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here's some pictures of balance. You can see a tightrope walker, an elephant on a beach ball, that's right, and rocks balanced on some boards. Okay, these are examples of dynamic balance and one static balance. The dynamic balance is there is activity or motion to maintain that balance. The tightrope walker or the rope walker is using his equilibrium to maintain balance. I don't know how the elephant is doing that. And the rocks are in steady. And if you look at the base of support, what we talked about contact with the supporting surface, the rope, the ball, and the round rock on a post, they're pretty small bases of support. So that balance, that sense of equilibrium must be very precise. Okay, next slide. So here's an illustration of base of support, every point of contact. So in the first slide, in the left is a narrow base of support and a wider base of support, that area of the second sacral vertebrae, because the feet are spread apart, it actually drops down a little bit. But as you can see, the center of gravity is centered over the base of support. And in most cases, the wider the support, the more stable the object. Okay, next slide. Here's an illustration of a relationship between the center of gravity and the base of support. 
The figure on the left, the lady has two feet on the ground. Our second sacral vertebrae is centered over the midpoint of between the two bases of support. If some of her weight or mass is moved out to the side, including eliminating one of the bases of support, you can see the center gravity is not over the base of support, which results in a fall. Hope that makes a little bit of sense in putting the center of gravity and the base of support together and see the relationship between the two. Okay, next slide. Okay, there are three sensory components of balance. One comes from the vestibular system, which is in the inner ear, vision, which is your eyesight, that's pretty self-explanatory, and proprioception, which is your sense of position. Now, these are the responsibilities, the con contribution of each of these sensory components to balance, with eyesight only being 10%. And I'll explain that a little more, and that can change as CES or anything else progresses. Next slide. This is a rendition of the vestibular component or which is in the inner ear. It's located behind the eye and a little bit lateral to the eye. It's pretty small. It's about the size of half of your end bone in your little finger. That's pretty small. Considering what a gyroscope did in the early rockets were about the size of a big suitcase. This is a very tiny but a very complicated organ. The round part on the right is, in, is responsible for hearing, the cochlea and the cochlear duct. And we're going to talk about the semicircular canals, which is the vestibular component of balance. And as you can see, semicircular is a good description. There are circles, there are tubes, and they're aligned in different, in different ways. The horizontal or lateral tube is responsible for detecting motion of the head when it rotates from left to right. Now these tubes are filled with fluid, not completely filled, so the fluid can move as the head moves. And within these tubes are little tiny hairs, which are nerve endings that sense the movement of the fluid, transmit that information to the brain, and the brain detects that you are motion or where your head is in space. As we said, the horizontal detects rotation. The posterior, which is the one at, at the top, is transverse and it detects laying your ear over toward your shoulder or lateral motion of the head or of the body. But this is just the, in the head, so it will detect when the head is moving or if the whole body is moving. And the other is the anterior circle. It's aligned straight up and down, and it detects when you're nodding or bending your head backwards. So these little tiny tubes detect motion. Little tiny hairs that are nerve endings send the information to the brain. Okay, next slide. Okay, vestibular input, what can affect the messages and the information that these circular, semicircular canals receive? They can be affected by an ear infection. I'm sure most of us have had ear infections and may have felt dizzy at the times. Fluid in the ear can affect the balance portion contributed by the inner ear. A head injury, obviously injuries to the head can injure the organ and therefore change the information that the brain receives. And the fourth one we can't do anything about, hopefully, is aging. Aging can affect the information and how the information of this fluid moving in the inner ear gets interpreted by the brain. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's the visual component. Now, Obviously, we get visual component and visual input from the eyes. Okay, next slide. Visual input. This can be affected by poor eyesight. Any condition compromising eyesight. Monovision, if you're blind in one eye. Diabetes, which affects the nerves transmitting visual input to the brain. Macular de degeneration. And the amount of light, the amount of light in the room you're in, if you're in a dark room, it's going to be a lot more difficult to maintain balance. 
Okay, next slide. And then there's proprioception. This is gonna take a little more explanation what proprioception is. It's when you're aware of what position your body is in, whether you're upright, if you're laying on your side, with eyes closed and in a dark room, you can tell what position you're in. So this information that gets to the brain, it comes from little organs in the muscles, joints, tendons, and ligaments. And it's the component of balance that can be most affected by called equina syndrome. Okay, next slide. So this compromised proprioception, compromised by cauda equina, can increase percentages and in visual input from, or can said, increase the percentages from vestibular and visual input. What this means is if the proprioception contributes 70% to balance and it's compromised by say 50, so now it's only given 35%, can the inner ear and the eyes make up for the difference? Not really. So when this compromised, the proprioception is compromised and the sensory input we're getting from these proprioceptors, these sensors we have in the body, we're not able to maintain balance in the same way that someone without this impairment can, can do. Next slide. So here's a picture of some of these little tiny organs within the muscles, called a muscle spindle, within the tendons called a Golgi tendon organ. Now these tiny little sensors, even smaller than the vestibular system in the inner ear, can sense tension in the muscle to give you the perception and the understanding and awareness of your position. Now the illustration on the right shows a proprioception feedback loop. So you're getting sensation from the bottom of your feet, the touch, you're getting sensations from the organs in the tendon and within the muscles. They go into the spinal cord and are expressed up to the, an area in the base of the brain to get to process all this information. So a lot of information is coming in at a lot of time and the brain processes it and it does a very good job. Okay, next slide. So how does Caldequina syndrome affect balance? Well, Obviously, there are sensory deficits, and most of us could compare our, de our sensory deficits, and they would be totally different. My feeling may be less or more than someone else, and not just less or more, but interpret these feelings quite differently in the brain. So the severity depends on the amount of sensory loss. So how much percentage is lost from called equina syndrome how much percentage of this proprioception is lost. And again, it depends. It depends on how much loss there is, which, which is pretty obvious. And the more loss, the more sensory deficit. And these other, other components, the vestibular system and the eye, are not able to compensate and pick up higher percentages. So motor function can be decreased. We have decreased strength. A lot of us have decreased strength. Some of us don't. And the strength or weakness or lack of strength affects what we call strategies, joint strategies. Now, if you think about it, if you're standing with a fairly wide shoulder width gait or so shoulder width base of support, you've got an area within that standing balance that you can move your body forward, backward, side to side, and be able to not fall. Okay, if those if your muscles are weak. Your strategies, whether it comes from the ankle, the knee, or the hip, it's going to be affected. So are you able to compensate and be able to make that motion within the base of support to eliminate falls? So strengthening is an important part of rehabilitation. So the deficits can be sensory, and they can be functional or strength. Okay, next slide. So how do people assess or test for balance? Next slide. Okay, when to assess? Well, hopefully we all have been assessed for balance. Is the client or patient experiencing any falls, dizziness? Are we able to function on stairs, staggered with walking and changing direction and carry objects without support or assistance? Hopefully we're aware of this 
our caregivers were aware of this and know when to seek intervention or seek assessment from a medical professional. And hopefully, as far as the people with Cardi Quanta, hopefully we'll be, we've all done this, and hopefully the, the professionals treating people with Cardi Quanta syndrome, they have assessed balance and a thorough in, uh, assessment of balance. Next slide. So the balance testing has to be done by a healthcare professional. Please, like they say in the ads, don't try this at home. None of what I'm gonna talk about or, or demonstrate or show should be done at home. We should see a healthcare professional, whether that's a neurologist, primary care physician, physical or occupational therapist, and hopefully your primary care physician will know how to access these healthcare professionals. Okay, the, the balance testing is sensory and motor testing, especially in the lower extremities, which is gonna be affected with people with called equine syndrome. We're gonna have less sensation and we're gonna be weak. So in along with the sensory and motor testing, vision and hearing, medication review, st static and dynamic. If you go back to the pictures of the elephant, the man on tightrope and the rocks, the man on tightrope and the elephant on the beach ball or dynamic, they have to react to maintain that balance. Hopefully the rocks on the boards were static. It's in a sense of equilibrium and nothing's gonna change it. There's no external forces working on it. With the dynamic balance, there are external forces generated by us to maintain that balance. Okay, next slide. So the balance progression, which is done by a professional should be tested to change visual input. So it, it's only 10%, but there's a big difference between eyes open and eyes closed and even one eyes closed. So we would do testing with different bases of support and then change the visual input to see how that changes our balance. And sensory input, the proprioception could be shoes on, shoes off, soft surfaces, soft or angle surfaces. Difference between walking on a hardwood floor or a tile floor or walking on a padded carpet and a shag carpet. And I'm sure most of us that have some problems walking can tell the difference and know and have done safety changes in the home to accommodate this. Next slide. So if you could, this is an, this is an exercise that talks about tandem walking and I'll, I'll go in and, and talk a little bit about it later. Now, remember, this is a person without cardioquina, fairly young, fairly healthy, and still you can see this is not a perfect demonstration of tandem walking. Go ahead and play. This is the tandem walking exercise. So for this exercise, you're going to pretend that you're walking on a tightrope. So I place one foot directly in front of the other, having the toe touch the heel. The exercise is actually easier if you widen it up like so. So really make sure that the heel and the toe touch and that they're directly in line. By simply widening it, widening it out a little bit, it becomes much easier. We want this exercise to be a challenge. So the exercise looks like this. Just like so. So walking forward is easier than walking backward, but if you feel like you're doing a good job moving forward, you can also challenge yourself by going backwards as well. As always, my support, uh, my hand is just right above my support, okay, for security. So often when people are doing this, they're very wobbly, okay? If you feel like the exercise is easy, consider squinting your eyes, closing your eyes, which is quite the challenge, or perform performing it in a darkened room where you're not gonna get as much of that visual input to make the exercise harder. So I'd say go back and forth for about two minutes, all right? If you don't feel safe going backwards, don't do it, just work by going forwards. However, in time when you get confident, then definitely add the uh, backward motion in as well. Okay, as you saw in the demonstration, difference in the difference the feet are in front of the other can increase the balance when they're close and the heel touching the toe, it's gonna be a little more difficult. And even if you're not quite lined up, heel to toe and a little bit to the side and increases as he explains, but again, do not try this at home. This is a demonstration and an explanation of what tandem walking is or tandem stance. So the treatments for balance and strengthening 
should always initiate it and progress by a therapist trained in treating these balance deficits, physical therapist, occupational therapist, physical medicine specialist, anybody, but the treatments don't have to be on a regular basis where you go three times a week. It can be once a month to assess and change as you hopefully progress. Okay, next slide. Home safety, safety in the home, very important when we're dealing with balance issues, the evaluation by a neurologist, occupational physical therapist to can even evaluate the, the home itself for safe practices. Consider an assistive device. A cane can offer a very much, a very lot of assistance and prevent falls. Obstructions in the home, small object, rugs, shoes offering good support, not uh, flip-flops like a lot of us in Florida are ten, <laughs> have tendency to wear. So good shoes, just good common sense for safety in the home. Okay. So the standing balance progression done by a professional would start with the base of support and progress. Wide base, feet at shoulder width, narrower base, and the tandem stance. As we saw in the video, what tandem walking is, tandem stance is just one step a little further, a little more challenging. Now, these progressions shouldn't advance until one is totally confident in being able to stand unsupported. So again, safety is important and should be done under supervision. Next slide. Exercises. Any function we have, any muscle we have can be strengthened. I know a lot of us are weak, have some weakness. The weakness can be evaluated by a therapist and an exercise routine initiated by a therapist adjust as is needed. Now, this doesn't have to be a three time a week to a therapist. It can be a once every two week, once a month. They can set up a program, uh, advance it as necessary, and hopefully we will progress. Strength can be increased, even with cardioquinus syndrome. The strength we have, any strength we have can be increased, which is, good news and something to look forward to, but it should be adjusted and monitored, not necessarily that often by a therapist. Next slide. So safety first, have a medical professional managing, whether you're the medical professional, how do you manage your CES client? Our symptoms can fluctuate. We can have good days and bad days. They can progress different over six, months over a year. So physical activity, sensible shoes, hazards, light up your living space and assisted devices. All these can help prevent falls. So want a little bit knowledge about balance, how it works, how we get input to manage our balance, which is the vestibular system in the ear, the eyes and proprioception, which knows where we are in space and how to progress to increase balance, eliminate falls. You saw the statistics on falls, how prevalent falls are and how responsible for deaths. Second leading cause of death. All right, if you're here live, I will be available for questions afterward. Thank you very much.